since the white man first ventured into this new world, the barriers of ocean, tropic jungle, and mountains have separated the United States from the other Americas. Only yesterday, by our fastest means of surface travel, the progressive capitals of South America were farther away from the United States than was India. Today, this vast network of Pan-American airways links for the first time in history these 33 countries, colonies, and possessions, a thrilling monument to the United States Air Mail Service. The Trailblazer. The year is 19 and 29. Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh is about to take off from Miami, Florida with the first United States Air Mail for South America. To blaze a trail which was destined in five short years to span the Caribbean Sea and encircle the entire southern continent. The plane is the first of the famous Sikorsky amphibians built especially for this service. What a far cry to the great 19-ton clipper ships that now ply the airways of the southern hemisphere. Aboard these giant flying boats, largest airliners in the world, in addition to Uncle Sam's air mail, go some very unusual cargoes. Everything, books and even baby chicks. And it's all aboard for Havana, Kingston, Trinidad, and all points south, to Rio de Janeiro and even Buenos Aires, now only five days away. A full list of 40 passengers leave the Pan American Gateway at Miami for the West Indies and Central and South America. minutes, the magic skyline of Miami slips beyond the horizon. Before long, we pass this last tip of the North American mainland, just like it used to look in the old school geography. Then we're out over the blue waters of the Gulf Stream, speeding to Cuba at better than two miles a minute. It's hard to believe we're aboard an airplane when we roam around this luxurious clipper ship with its 50-foot aisle. There's a steward's buffet from which meals and refreshments are served, and even a smoking salon. In scarcely an hour and a half, we make a journey which by steamer takes a full day. Below us lies Havana, the pearl of the Antilles, Old Moro Fortress standing guard at the harbor's entrance, and the magnificent Capitol building set forth like the centerpiece in a jeweled crown of many colors. And here's the famous Malacan Boulevard and the historic monument erected by Cuba in memory of the Maine. We soar on while our radio keeps us in constant touch with the great network of ground stations, from which radio compasses keep our giant clipper ships spotted at all times. Our airliner is under the guard of three radio stations every minute we're aloft. To keep the air mail, passengers, and express on schedule. Each radio station is a complete weather bureau. Exact details of all conditions ahead and behind are relayed to pilots on the wing every few minutes. In five brief flying hours, we're circling over Kingston, Jamaica, one of the treasure islands of the Western Indies, nestling beneath lovely blue mountains on the edge of the Caribbean Sea. Once a pirate stronghold, this picturesque outpost of the British Empire is typical of colonial England today. 
The city itself, filled with quaint and interesting scenes, is famous for its beaches and resort attractions. About the palm-bordered coast, there are picturesque coves where pirates once hauled their loot ashore. The famous Blue Hills are alive with a thousand silvery cataracts that tumble through the brilliant tropic foliage. And here, of all places, you look upon herds of the sacred cattle of India wandering over palm-dotted pasture lands, imported here because they thrive in the tropic sunshine. Where buccaneers once moored their rakish craft, our clipper ship taxis out to the open roadstead, and we climb into the sky again and are off for the magic isle of Haiti. Barely 30 minutes and we're across the windward passage which took Columbus so many days of sailing. We're above the lovely bay in the city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti's famous capital. And here's the old French cathedral built in the days of Napoleon. This white marble capital, Palace of Haiti's president, is a glistening landmark in these southern islands. Just five brief hours as the airmail flies, and we're in this unique capital of a mystic land. Here are sights and sounds unmatched on the face of the globe. Here's a land where the eerie throbbing of native drums rolls down from the hills in the brilliant moonlight of the Haitian night. Here's the land where a slave once rose to be a king in agriculture with startlingly primitive tools. Here, for instance, is a hand-driven lathe. And here's a trimmer that works on bed springs. It has been the same from father to son through the centuries. Yet aided by such primitive methods, Haiti sells $50 million worth of manufactures, hardwood, coffee, sugar, and other products to the world every year. The cutting of this hardwood log represents a full day's work for both men and the superintendent. Before this log is half sawed through, a flying clipper ship will be halfway to the southern continent. In five brief hours from Miami, our giant clipper ship has spanned the 800 miles to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And we're off for Santo Domingo, first of the white man's capitals in America and the beginning of the Spanish Main. Beyond Port-au-Prince, we fly directly over the historic citadel of Haiti's Black King Christophe, built on the very peak of a mountain. In less than 20 minutes, we have crossed all eastern Haiti, and beyond our window lie the chalk cliffs of Santo Domingo, which so often sheltered the brave sailing craft of Columbus. minutes more through a cooling tropic shower, we're cruising by the ancient city of Santo Domingo itself, founded more than four centuries ago by Columbus. This is the river into which his ships of discovery sailed and on whose banks he built the city destined to become the gateway to a new world. The tree to which Columbus tied his flagship still stands along the river bank. And here in the heart of the city he founded and which later refused him entrance and sent him back to Spain in disgrace is the first cathedral ever built in the Americas. Within this old church filled with priceless treasures, the cradle of America's history, lie the mortal remains of the great discoverer. These bells were among the many gifts of Ferdinand and Isabel and many of the crowned heads of Europe to Columbus and to this historic shrine. And here are the ruins of the castle of Diego Columbus, son of the discoverer, who lived to govern the city his father built.
Leaving Santo Domingo, speeding on with the mail, we head over the famous Mona Passage for Puerto Rico. The cockpits of these great flying clipper ships are like the bridge of a liner. Pilot, co-pilot, radio operator, and flight mechanic occupy posts in this forward compartment. Then San Juan, Puerto Rico, slips beneath and we glide to a landing in the storied harbor just eight hours from Miami. When Columbus landed on the west coast of this little island in 1493, he named it San Juan. A few years later, Ponce de Leon founded the city and named it Puerto Rico. Now the names are curiously transposed and the name of the city is given to the island and the name of the island to the city. The island was ceded to the United States after the war with Spain. Today it is the only territory under the stars and stripes where Christopher Columbus ever set foot. And here's the famous old Moro fortress, begun by Ponce de Leon in 1533, long before the first settlers came to Jamestown. Busy harbor under the shadow of the ancient sea walls, we change planes and speed on with the mail to South America. Scarcely 30 minutes from San Juan and we're over St. Thomas, capital of the Virgin Islands. Then Saba Island, a Dutch colony without a harbor, where Dutch sea captains come to live when they retire from the sea. Boats must anchor far out in the open roadstead and all supplies are brought ashore in this fashion. But this is not the hardest part. When they're safe ashore, they must be carried 800 feet up the side of this peak and thence into the town of Bottom, so-called because it rests on the bed of an extinct volcano. We refuel in St. John's Antigua, seat of the government of the British Leeward Islands, where Admiral Nelson fitted out his fleet for the Battle of Trafalgar. Then on past Mount Paley, whose eruption in 1902 buried the city of St. Pierre and its 30,000 people beneath this river of lava. Shortly, the island of Trinidad appears, along the base of which spreads Port of Spain, eastern crossroads of the New World, with the headlands of the South American continent looming across the channel. Port of Spain, one of the world's most cosmopolitan cities. Since Sir Walter Raleigh first sailed into this harbor centuries ago, people from all the world have come to Port of Spain but the city still maintains a dominant British atmosphere. A new industry along these ancient trade routes is the air service. Great airdromes in which well-trained staffs of mechanics and engineers take meticulous care of every detail of the airliner. This gives some impression of the vast organization behind Uncle Sam's airmail service. Northern tip of South America, just two days from Florida, we race on with the air mail along the western rim of the Atlantic toward the equator. Here are broad stretches of the New World, which before the coming of the airplane, comparatively few people of the United States had ever seen. Southward from the delta of the great Orinoco River lie the Guianas, the only European colony on the South American continent. Here is Georgetown, capital of the colony of British Guiana.
sun map before the coming of the airplane, our airliner flies its sure, swift course. Beyond the border of British Guiana, the flat rice fields and canals of Dutch Guiana slip beneath our plane. The quaint city of Paramaribo, capital of Dutch Guiana, straggling around the bend of the racing jungle river Suriname. Government House, where the Dutch governors have lived for more than a hundred years with the statue of Queen Wilhelmina standing in the front yard. Parmariba is like a bit of the mother country with its spotless streets and glistening houses. The plump ladies of Parmariba wear the historic costumes of old Holland. Only a few minutes from the main streets of the city lies the jungle and another world. Here is one of the world's highest waterfalls, many times the height of Niagara, discovered only 60 years ago. And even today, they've been looked upon by very few white men. The primitive natives, for fear of being swept away by the grandeur of these falls, blind themselves before passing by. And here in the interior of Dutch Guiana, just 45 hours from Broadway as the airmail flies, is the land of the Bush Negro, former slaves of the Dutch colonists who escaped into the jungle more than 200 years ago. The men folks of the village spend hours over this put and take game. They make their own sugar and squeeze the juice from the wild cane by means of this wooden press. And this is the way bread is made from the cassava root. Baked on an iron plate, it is set out in the sunshine to dry. And then it may either be eaten or worn as a sunshade. With remarkable artistry, the bush nigger carves his implements, his tableware, out of wood. they're still confronted with the universal problem, the harmonizing of babies and bats. Out of the jungle come innumerable species of hardwoods. It's heartbreaking work getting these great logs to the river. Since they are too heavy to float, they're placed aboard rafts and ferried down to the seaport. many hours to fell one of these jungle giants. In the more open spaces, water buffalo are used to drag the prim logs through the forest. dugout canoes manned by the best of the jungle oarsmen preserve communication with the capital from which the airmail preserves touch with the world.
without the slightest fear, they guide their fragile craft into the turbulent rapids. Exciting race goes on. Striking panorama of Brazil's vast east coast below us, impenetrable jungle and meandering rivers. Sphere. Then, like some dream city in a fairy tale, the incredibly beautiful panorama of Rio de Janeiro spreads beneath you, acclaimed by world travelers as the most beautiful city on earth. famous Sugarloaf Mountain rising 1,400 feet straight out of the lovely bay as we circle over the city. Then we skirt the business section which extends right down to the waterfront. Flowing in and out between and around palm-covered hills and the shimmering peaks that pierce the picture-like bay, Rio de Janeiro is the second largest city on the South American continent, one of the five largest in the Western Hemisphere. Great boulevards span the city, which was founded 70 years before the pilgrims landed in North America. Great arcs of glistening beach or geometrically designed coastline frame the city at the edge of the sea. The Avenida Rio Branco, Rio's Fifth Avenue, is one of the most famous streets in all the world. Sidewalk cafes are popular places of vantage from which to watch the colorful life of the city pass by. In every direction, interesting streets and resplendent boulevards meet the eye. And here's the Brazilian edition of the Fuller Brush Man. The lovely Sugarloaf Mountain seems to be at the end of every boulevard. One of the most unusual characteristics of Rio is its sidewalks made up of small stones of many colors laid in patterns. One of our palace, home of the President of the Republic. Boulevard Atlantico and the magnificent Copacabana Beach. Surf bathing is a favorite sport with the people of Rio, the world's loveliest beach at their very front door. This Church of the Rock is a famous shrine and is visited by many thousands of worshipers. During pilgrimages, the more devout often climb these stairs on their knees.
so interesting is Rio to look at that even the people who live in the city spend most of their spare time sightseeing. And the trip up Corcovada Peak to this colossal statue of Christ is one of the favorites. The largest Christian statue in the world. This great white figure is another imposing symbol of the grandeur of Rio de Janeiro. From the Atlantic coast of Brazil to the port of Santos, what was once a day's journey by sea is now but a brief hour or two of aerial sightseeing, or a rubber of bridge, Spanning the western rim of the Atlantic for 7,500 miles, the great clipper ships of the air thunder over Montevideo. Out of the harbor of Montevideo, the clipper ship feed on with Uncle Sam's airmail, up the famous River of Silver. By means of radio, our pilot is guided up this great river, which is more than 200 miles wide where it meets the Atlantic, so wide that we're out of sight of land as we follow its course inland. Then Buenos Aires, largest city in all of Latin America, often referred to as the Paris of the Southern Hemisphere, spreads beneath our wings just six days from the United States. Buenos Aires is one of the busiest seaports of the world. A marvel of engineering has transformed the flat and muddy riverfront into a modern port with electric cranes, elevators, warehouses, and row after row of ocean liners. Those who fly to Buenos Aires, the River of Silver becomes a reality, caught in the rays of the setting sun. In clamor and industrial speed, the city has no rival south of the United States. It resembles Chicago with its man-made waterfront and it's almost as large in population. Like Chicago, it has grown powerful from the wealth of the country's grain, meat, wool, and hides. Here's the Avenida Florida, the Fifth Avenue of Buenos Aires. In the late afternoon, all traffic is barred and hundreds of thousands of people stroll up and down. The influence of old England is strong in Argentina. Here in the traditional costume of centuries ago is a real live chimney sweep. No city in the world can rival Buenos Aires in the magnificence of its public monuments. Here's the beautiful Spanish monument presented by the mother country on the 100th anniversary of Argentine independence. a channel dredged into the river plate, 28 miles wide at Buenos Aires, great ocean liners steam directly into these canals. And into these vast warehouses come agricultural and industrial machinery, automobiles and building materials to the value of half a billion dollars each year. Argentina is also a nation of sport lovers. Here at Palemore is one of the most pretentious race courses in the world, and they're off! Sunday afternoon crowd urges the favorite home. 
There are three tracks and three races are sometimes run at the same time as a climax to a match. Not far from Buenos Aires is Mar del Plata, the Palm Beach of the Republic, with casinos and public baths like the famous spas of the old world. of Argentina, which stretches from the Atlantic to the very feet of the Andes Mountains in the west, is truly characteristic of this great republic. Here at Lujan is one of the most famous religious shrines in the world. Pilgrims from many lands journey here, purchase candles from these picturesque trundle carts, and make their offerings. More romantic in nature than the tango, its greatest fanciers and the other interesting characteristics of the pampa is the gaucho. Here in the gray light of dawn, we catch a glimpse of them bringing a herd of pampa cattle to the markets of Buenos Aires. 